Um, I, so my, my plan is just to kind of talk about where the geothermal sector is now. This is, you know, across Europe, there could be kind of global connotations, but you know, rather than me talking to you and telling you how I see the world, um, what I'm really keen to do is to see, is to kind of get your ideas, your thoughts, your observations, um, once we've had a chance to kind of progress through the um, the slides that I want to, 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 to take you through now. Um, so this is more of a conversation rather than me telling you what, what the lay of the land is. Um, and really the kind of question we're, we've been grappling our heads for some time now is, is um, when will geothermal become mainstream? Will it ever become mainstream? Um, and what do we, what are the the pathways or the stepping stones that we need to uh, progress along to get to that mainstreaming. Um, okay, so um, I'm kind of broken this talk down into three segments, kind of what does the geothermal sector need? What have we just recently uh, secured in terms of a, a new legal framework? Um, and where do we need to go? Um, so without further ado, let me start off with the uh, uh, geothermal needs. Again, this is built upon conversations with the sector, um, various parts of um, um, EJEX membership, but also people who are looking into the world of geothermal, kind of coming you, you know, people who want to make investments, people who want to finance investments, people just trying to understand how do we decarbonize and, you know, what role can geothermal play within it. Now, the kind of North Star of mo uh, um uh, the, the, the North Star for all of our needs effectively comes down to visibility. Um, and I'm sure those who are in the sector will know that nobody uh, nobody knows about geothermal until they discover geothermal. Um, often it's the last thing they discover. It's at the, it's at the end of a very long list. And once you've discounted all the other kind of technology solutions, um, one discovers geothermal and says, well, why, doesn't, why didn't anyone tell me about this before? Um, and uh, this is, you know, this is one of the key things. Many applications, certainly those in heating and cooling, are invisible. Once you drill the borehole, um, uh, it's, you know, covered up. You simply don't see it, see it anymore. You may have a heat pump in a in a room somewhere in a basement um, of a large building, where very few people will ever um, uh, wander in. So visibility is actually quite an important thing. Whilst it's a benefit in terms of much of the environmental community. In the real world where everything is visual and you need to see it to know that it exists, um, uh, geothermal has a huge strategic disadvantage. Um, so that visibility is both a physical visibility, but also a political visibility. The more people talk about geothermal, the better it will be understood. Its needs and bottlenecks will be able to be addressed. So the visibility is quite a, quite a crucial thing and everything is pinned around this one. Um, following on from that, a key part of the, the geothermal sector is to, is to drill. Um, so, you know, drilling costs, how do we bring down the costs? How do we uh, look at different kind of uh, business models to allow for drilling costs to be amortized over a long period of time is, is quite an essential issue because, you know, the lifetime of a project, uh, the total, uh, and in terms of the total costs, uh, drilling is the most significant chunk uh, um, of any project. So it's, a, it's a, an important part of our sector. Um, and the more conversations we can have, the more solutions we can have to bring down those costs, the healthier we will become, or the more lucrative the offering we can provide will become. With this also goes, uh, when one's looking for uh, um, geothermal resources, um, hot waters, uh, rock formations, then actually the geological risk is, is a critical part as well. And that's part of the, the challenges that we have when it comes to drilling and drilling cost reductions. So ways in which the, 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 those risks can be mitigated in terms of geological data, um, uh, but also kind of, you know, genuine project development and financial risk as well are need to be wrapped into, into that space. So this is, these are two of the vital uh, blocks from a project developer perspective. As I mentioned earlier, consumer awareness is really quite important. So we're kind of going through a space now where a lot of local authorities, local governments um, uh, across Europe, but, but actually across across the world, um, have started to look at their heating and cooling networks and realise that they, they need to find ways to provide a stable energy resource, which is possibly low cost and ideally low maintenance. Um, and we've gone through kind of conv conventional combustibles from fossils down to some kind of combustible renewables. 
But the advantage that geothermal has is that you can do widespread decarbonisation at scale. Um, and that scalability seems to be the thing that's attracting a lot of our local authorities who have to look at um, addressing local heating and cooling networks, but also utilities who have heating and cooling customers and now need to offer a more climate friendly um, and sustainable solution. So this consumer awareness is very important. Um, you will always hear, if you talk to new people, they'll be surprised that geothermal exists in their country. So I live in um, Brussels and um, the first question, or, or the first observation everybody will make is, well, there's no geothermal in Belgium. And um, I have some very interesting examples just last year and the year before when we were talking to members of the European Parliament, MEPs, um, and they were saying, well, you possibly can't do geothermal in, in Belgium. And then we had to show them to look out the window and one part of the European Parliament is already um, heated and cooled by, by a big uh, geothermal system. So it exists. The invisibility is, 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 is why we need to focus a lot on consumer awareness. Our targets. Um, targets are super, super important when we're looking at growing a sector, especially um, a clean technology sector. Almost all of these are policy driven. So policies are not just subsidies, but growth targets, um, kind of regulatory support. All of these things are very, very important. It gives us an indication of you know, where one where the industry will look like in a period of time, and then it allows for the supply chain to be built up around it. So targets are are essential. And importantly, when you're looking at a new segment, a new consumer segment, piloting geothermal to build awareness of, of, of it is, is quite essential as well. So both of those uh, um, issues are, are essentially the same. It's a proof of concept and then um, uh, a delivery on the concept. Um, targets are very, very vital to, to our sector. Of course, permitting uh, for every single geothermal application, a permit of some sort is required or a, a, a legal uh, uh, email notification uh, down to a very complex, long-winded environmental impact assessment, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we can't avoid permitting, but permitting is, is super important and it's harmonized, uh, much more robust and efficient. Finally, finance. Finance is uh, how we pay for geothermal, um, whether it's through um, uh, a consumer paying for it themselves up front, uh, irrespective of what type of consumer it is, um, down to kind of innovative business models that allow us to uh, build infrastructure, much larger systems, um, and finance them over the, the quickest uh, period of time to, to make back one's investment. So these are the general needs for geothermal um, uh, that we perceive. There may be new ones. If there are new ones, we can kind of pick that up at the end um, in the Q&A session. Um, but let's, uh, this is the starting point for where, um, uh, when we start to plan through what we have to focus on, what we need to prioritize when it comes to the geothermal activities that we do in a policy and advocacy space, this is the, the, the foundation stone um, that we look at. Um, now, visibility, I talked about visibility, um, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, looking at different ways in which we can achieve that visibility. And I'm going to give a couple of examples here. Um, so the first example is uh, the French government and their national roadmap for geothermal. We've, we've started to see these emerge. And one of the key things that we're asking for um, is for a European uh, geothermal uh, roadmap so that we can identify bottlenecks and actually start to, to, to make sure the supply chain is, is moving, but also that the customers and their customer awareness is is uh, um, to a level where we can start to you know grow much much quicker and much deeper than we, we've done before. So the French roadmap is interesting, and the reason why I put this down is this is not an academic exercise. This is not a, a a document that kind of rests on the shelves. This is a a a blueprint for how the French government is trying to organise the French industry, and this is this is why I think it's an important example for us to to go through. Um, so they've identified kind of six areas. Um, there was two versions of this. The very first version came out in February. It was then updated in December 2023 with, you know, I think it's 50 action points on, to address and to kind of finesse all of the, the, the six points, the six chapter headings um, of this strategy. So here we're looking, you know, the, the French were, were looking much more about um, uh, surface geothermal, how, you know, how do you, how do you develop kind of a, a shallow um, uh, industry quicker? What actually needs to happen to national regulations, to regional variations on those? Um, how, how, how does one produce a 
accessible geological data so that consumers and project developers can um, uh, uh, you know, maximize potentials. Um, importantly, kind of identifying certain sectors and key technologies within it. So for um, the residential kind of commercial buildings, looking at you know, accelerating in, in reducing thermal heat pumps, um, and moving on from there, looking at the kind of subsidy schemes that are required, whether, whether there's a, a need to subsidize individual households or to have greater prioritization for network planners. So you can have a bigger um, uh, outlay of investment in that way, become more socially inclusive. This is where that thinking is coming from. Um, again, promoting subsoil, getting the geological uh, or the national geological survey to become much more responsive, but also proactive in identifying um, and reaching out to um, uh, uh, project developers within France is quite important. There's a lot of activity that's happened behind this. There's a lot of changes to, for example, the building codes that were made in 2023. One of the amendments to the, the, the building code in France um, uh, requires a, a geological assessment, or if there's any geological data for it to be presented whenever a building um, is put forward for renovations or whether there's a plan for permit for a brand new build um, uh, to be made. So again, it's raising the visibility, bringing geothermal front and center just to help move the French economy off of a, a fossil um, related uh, energy consumption. Again, um, point five is focusing on skills, making sure you've got a workforce that is competent and efficient within France. And this helps bring down the costs and maintain standards. But also, and really the, the interesting thing that's kind of underlying this uh, French national plan is that they're looking for um, uh, growth markets outside France. So what the government is trying to do and how they justify themselves is to say that, look, we, we want to build an industrial strategy around geothermal. Geothermal is a technology, we want to be masters of this technology, but we also want to capture as much as possible for French industry, new and emerging markets in Europe and globally. And I think this is a good way of looking at geothermal. It speaks to national politics, it treats geothermal not as an energy or a, or a renewable energy in particular, but it treats it as an industrial policy uh, vehicle for the French economy. And this is this is an important lesson. And this is part of what we want to get from the European strategy, a part of what we also want the European strategy then to ask other member states to sit down and do a similar type of thinking around it. I'm not here to tell you that the French are brilliant. I'm just here to say that this is a good example. Let me give you an example of Poland. Now, Poland's uh, national uh, roadmap again, um, came out uh, two years ago now. Um, I, this was, a, in, in many ways, it's, it's a slightly different take to the one that the French have, in the sense that in Poland, where they're starting to grow their geothermal sector, they're looking at kind of, uh, you know, a few areas where they can get competitive advantage. So, there's a really interesting uh, feature within the, the Polish roadmap, which looks at uh, kind of capturing um, uh, mine waters, uh, reconverting coal mines. Obviously, Poland has a long history of uh, coal mining. There's a lot of um, uh, coal capacity, but also disused capacity as well. So reutilizing that, you know, how does the country organize itself around this? Um, they're looking at um, look, uh, they're looking at their first kind of power plants by 2040. Again, this is a, an example of target setting. But what I find really, really interesting is this heat storage and the way in which they're thinking about heat storage and why they're thinking about it. So what they say here is, is that um, according to their assessments, and I, and I think there, there's a lot of uh, solid ground around this one, um, is that storage is going to increasingly become the critical path to mo much of our decarbonization, much of our discussion around energy policy, much more than it's ever been before. Um, and utilizing of the 200 installations, they want to try uh, they want to experiment with 100 deep boreholes um, and 100 aquifer uh, thermal energy storage systems. So again, these are going to be half of 50% uh, um, funded by the national government. The rest is coming from the private sector. And the idea is, is really to understand this, what kind of regulations are needed around it, what, what, what innovation, technology, support systems, permitting procedures are required to, to really drive the storage market. Um, uh, this is this I think is going to be valuable learning for the rest of Europe. So so really there's there's whilst this is important for, for Poland, this is important for, for us globally.
Um, and what the government have done here as well, which is interesting compared to the French one, is, is they've costed a lot of the programs and the measures and identified very clearly how much of this is going to come from the public purse, how much of this has to come from the you know other sources. One of the interesting things within this plan, um, actually on the second page, is, is their, their justification for why they're doing um, uh, geothermal. So again, uh, Poland, because of its power sector being very heavily dominated um, around coal mining, and there's an issue around the, kind of the coverage and depth of uh, the electricity grid across the, the country. When it comes to heat and electrifying heat, they're very, very clear that they they that they want to focus on uh, geothermal heat pumps, shallow geothermal, to drive a lot of the um, a lot of the heat market um, because it takes the pressure off their power system. And this, I think, is is a discovery that many other governments, many other energy system planners, are going to come to at some stage. In fact, there's a fascinating piece of research in the U.S. by the Oak Ridge Foundation, which has uh, effectively put some numbers um, on a simulation in the case of the U.S. Um, I thought I'd also mention Ireland's policy statement. So again, Ireland had a target, uh, the Irish government had a target for, um, I think it was 60,000 heat pumps by 2030. Uh, the number may be, uh, no, 600,000, there you go. Um, uh, 600,000 heat pumps by uh, 2030. This is in the National Climate and Energy Plan, NECP for short. Um, and as they've started to, to look through this, conversations were had around the impact on the power system and how does, the, how does one kind of progress and move forward with this one. And the government then discovered geothermal. And here you see a very clear, I think a very logical policy statement. So rather than producing a, a consultation like the two countries before, they actually went for a consultative process. There was a lot of engagement with not just the, consume, the producers, the geothermal sector, but also consumers of geothermal services. And I think this process is quite quite a quite a valuable conversation to be had, um, particularly, you know, working out ways in which they can reach out to local authorities and what are the lessons that have been, what are the best practices that exist already and what can be tweaked for the, for the national environment. So you've got three examples here of, of national strategies you know, some of them are, are structured in a different way, but they're all kind of asking or, or responding to the same question, which is as how do we grow our market because we have an urgent need to make investments within our energy system. Now, in some countries, you've had regional uh, examples. And I pick Wallonia partly because I, I live in Belgium and I follow quite closely what's happening in, um, in, in, uh, in Belgian politics. Um, and what you found is, is that in, in Wallonia, which is southern Belgium, um, uh, the president of the region, uh, Mr. Du Rupia, who was a former prime minister of the country, um, he, he basically drove home a renewable energy plan for 2030. This was the, the basis for how the whole region was going to um, make itself future-proof for a low-carbon um, uh, world. Um, on the back of this, uh, there were, you know, th there was a pressing need, the bulk of the heating consumption within households um, and large parts of industry is heavily reliant on gas. So they had a gas supply issue. This is long before the Ukraine uh, crisis emerged. Um, but what, what again happened here is, is that geothermal didn't really feature much within the plan. Um, in the initial plan, it was largely focused around um, uh, you know, waste gases and biomass. But once geothermal was discovered, um, then what they've seen is, is a, quite a rapid, uh, uh, um, uh, quite a rapid amount of investment in stimulating the local economy, building local companies, local supply chains, um, and local understanding and awareness of how do you do geothermal systems, how do you plan them, what are the permitting processes that are around. So the, the reason why this is important is, is that you've had national plans, now you've got a regional plan. There are a few other regions. There's one in um, North Brabant in, in, uh, um, in the Netherlands as well, which is also looking at uh, a similar regional approach where they're testing out um, different types of, um, uh, of geothermal applications. The, the first thing they did was to do a tender, a grants-based tender, 34 projects were approved. Um, and from this, you had different applications, for example, um, uh, network geothermal in rural communities through new builds. Um, you know, the, 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 one of the 
iconic project is going to be a brand new mega hospital built in Shanghai, um, which is going to be, uh, I think it's 20 or 30% of the energy system will come from geothermal efforts at the start of the Hopefully that will be built on later. There's quite a famous uh, zoo as well, lots of pharmaceutical buildings. So they're testing different types of buildings um, in order to understand which ones are the most effective from private residential buildings to commercial buildings, um, uh, so on and so forth. Um, if you just uh, hold on for a second. Um, so uh, you can see uh, you can see a, a variety of things um, um, emerging here um, from this one. So it gives a good a good understanding and a good explanation on the different ways in which we can use a geothermal uh, strategy and why, they, why they're so important for the industry. Um, and once you have that kind of North Star of you have a strategy, then you can, and a target, then you can start to think through some of the detailed issues that, that underpin them. So for example, how do you do with pilot projects? Um, you know, are there some industrial sectors where one needs to try? We saw in the case of Wallonia that they they I, you know explicitly wanted to look at um, public buildings. There are a few other countries which are looking at public buildings in order to get a foothold and an understanding for geothermal before they push out. Um, planning for guidance, I'm going to come on to later. What type of uh, support is needed? So you, you, I've given two examples here. You have the Dutch scheme, um, which is the SDE++. Um, this is a, um, uh, uh, this is the kind of uh, um, scheme where you uh, focus on uh, providing the subsidy through operational costs. So whatever the price of energy is, it's, it's pegged to um, a specific uh, number and then you get, a, you get your return, you get a sub subsidy support if it's below a threshold or above, and above a threshold you don't. Um, whereas the Fond Chaleur in France is directly looking at bringing down the cost of drilling, which is a, a different approach. And what we find is, is that the, the Fond Chaleur uh, approach is much more effective in, in addressing the, the needs of uh, geothermal development in France. Um, again, looking at the different permitting rules, they're, they're unique in every country. They're often in some countries you have unique national and uh, sorry, unique regional variations. So deep diving into what these are, how does one standardize them, if it's possible to standardize them, how does one look at not just the, the permitting process itself, but the permitting agencies themselves. Do you have enough people who are competent and aware um, and trained to be able to make decisions quickly? Um, because you know that then allows for a decision to be made rather than actually delaying getting external expertise, which adds to the cost profile of, of a project. Um, people, making sure you've got skilled uh, professionals is essential if you want to ensure a level of a quality assurance across the, the entire sector. But this also applies to people who are doing uh, heat density planning for the very first time. Uh, a skill which is kind of often outsourced is now, you know, there's a regulatory driver to have that um, internalized. Again, support for manufacturing, you know, building as many of the component features for a, for a geothermal system within your country helps win the local politics because it's local jobs, it's local industrial uh, growth, looking at standardizing business models, and of course, it, you know, accessing geological data. These are all the kind of things that you can start to deep dive into once you've got a broader understanding of what the strategy is, because then you're pushing the entire uh, the, uh, uh, industrial ecosystem in, in one direction. So that's kind of what the geothermal sector needs, um, and that will help us to grow much, much, much clearer. Let's see now what, what actually came out of the, the, the climate and energy uh, package of forms, the European Green Deal, which we um, just had uh, agreed a uh, um, and we're still getting the final pieces of agreed together. So this is a very ambitious plan. It started off in 2019 with the European elections. For those who don't know, uh, in 23 days' plan, we're going to have the next round of European elections. So this is a five-year cycle. The European Parliament changes, the Commission changes, and the Commission's ethos in uh, 2019 was that, okay, the climate targets that we had before were good, but they weren't good enough, so we've got to increase them. Uh, to minus 55%. Once you do that, you then have to go back and look at all of the underpinning uh, aspects where you're going to make the, the emission reductions, largely the energy system, uh, climate for kind of um, uh, industrial applications, and of course, the transport system. So within that, you have a whole myriad of, of legislation, as with uh, anyone who's familiar with um, kind of European legislation or anything European, there's always an, an aphorism that goes with it. So renewable energies, uh, uh, the Renewable Energy Directive is called RED, 
energy efficiency is called EEB. Um, the emissions trading system is called the ETS. Uh, and Lulu CS stands for Land Use, Land Change, and Forestry. So you have all of these mechanisms, but this is the kind of like the overall framework uh, for legislation. But rather than going through every single one of those, what I've done is, is I've picked out the, the things that we think are going to move the needle in terms of investment. Um, and this is this this for us is is really where we spent a lot of our time um, kind of building momentum within the decision making process to make sure that we secured this. So the first thing, and I think the most important one, is this binding target for uh, heating and cooling within the Renewable Energy Directive. A binding target means you have to legally uh, deliver the target, and if you don't deliver the target, you start to get fines. A government is fined for underachieving. So making a target binding is very, very important. It's politically where you get the biggest returns. It's also the hardest rock to push up the, the deepest, um, uh, the, the steepest mountain. So it's, it's, a, it's a hard fight, but the fully secured this for the very first time means that governments now are going to have to start taking renewable heating and cooling much more seriously than they've done before. This is why the target to start off with is quite small. It's a percentage point target. So it, it means that you have to have 0.8% increase every year um, uh, up until 2025. This is well within business as usual. Then it moves up to 1.1. Um, the, the numbers are quite low in terms of ambition, but that's not really the point. The point now is, is the next time this is revised, these numbers are going to be much heavily ramped up. And what you find is, is that in some cases, some countries are much more advanced in renewable heating and cooling, others are less so. But from our perspective, this is really going to start to mean that there's a financial penalty for not looking at heating and cooling one of the big markets for geothermal. On top of that, second big driver, and, and this this in many ways is going to be, hold the successful implementation of this is going to be quite critical to the future of geothermal, um, is this mandate for local authorities um, with populations over 45,000 inhabitants to prepare a local heat and cold map. Now, you'll recall from the, the, the slide uh, from Charlois, where they did the local heating and cooling maps, um, that really did help them to discover geothermal and to go for deep and shallow geothermal uh, en masse. Um, so this is, this is going to be quite a crucial thing. In some countries, this already happens. Germany passed a law just recently to do this, but this has now been replicated across all of Europe. So we now, there's many local authorities who are scratching their heads saying, look, we've, we've, we've kind of outsourced the responsibility for running heating in, uh, networks. Um, uh, now it's essential for us to start bringing this back in. We have ownership over this issue. We have to provide our national governments with, with a degree of guidance. So this, I think, is going to be super, super important. Another element is the renewable acceleration areas, or RAS, as we, as we like to call them. Um, they are based actually on the shallow geothermal industry's uh, traffic light system for uh, permitting. Um, and what they've done, what this has kind of been translated fully into a European approach. So um, member states, together with um, uh, the European Commission, are planning areas where you can build, geoth where you can build renewables. Um, quickly and you have the least impact on the environment. And for those, you get um, a fixed timeline of a one year for your permitting process, um, which, are, which is absolutely fantastic. And in some cases, they can't go more than two years if it's a bit more complicated. It's really forcing a quick, quick decision to get the investments sunk into the ground. Um, uh, and uh, with this, you get all sorts of support in terms of preferential. Um, uh, as a member state, you, you're able to provide much more preferential subsidies to get these uh, projects up and running. So you have a chance where GSM, for example, is going to, where you can have very good resources. The theory now, once these are agreed, is, is that you'll be able to go really quickly in terms of getting geo GSM projects realized there. So this, again, is, is one where you're, you're gonna, you should expect to see investments happen triggered by this. Um, the next, uh, uh, the, the, the last three things are are important, but they, they have kind of different levels of importance. So the first are kind of compulsions. Um, uh, what you have here in terms of the Social and Climate Fund is a, is a brand new fund, and this is really targeting people who are going to have a carbon price placed on household heating for the very first time um, with a chance to alleviate or to depressure the, the, the impact on the, the least uh, 
um, uh, wealthy within within society. So this is kind of looking at vulnerable households and it's providing financing for them. And part of the, the gambit for us as a, in the industry is to make sure that we don't just look at one individual household, but we try and bring a community together. There are many examples of social housing um, uh, across Europe where, um, uh, you know, rather than looking at one or two individual houses, they look at the entire system. The Kenza project in uh, Enfield in the UK is one example. We have uh, a few projects in Poland as well, um, uh, where you know you looked at social housing uh, buildings, and instead of doing one or two people, you did the entire building, a uh, whole multi multi um, uh, a multi apartment uh, uh, lodging. So these are these are th this is really an opportunity for Geothermal to to ramp up and and solve a politically important um, uh, issue. You also have heat purchase agreements. This is traditionally how some of the deeper geothermal projects have, have materialized. Um, they used to be called heat purchase agreements. Now they're called heating and cooling purchase agreements yeah. with the word renewable added onto them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but one of the issues here is, is that um, for some countries, things like uh, public private partnerships are very much ingrained. France is a good example. You've had nearly 30 years worth of standardization of them. So they effectively are something you can take off the shelf, fill in the blanks, and everyone has complete confidence in them. Whereas in some countries, you have to get lawyers to sit down and write the entire chapter for the, um, all the legal text for itself. So there's a lot of variables and moving parts. And the, as much as the standardization that we can do together as an industry will help us uh, uh, immensely. And then finally, risk mitigation frameworks. I mentioned how important this is. This was included within the Renewable Energy Directive as well. The problem is, is it's kind of down to each member state to do whatever they can. And really what we want to do is, is to say, let's let's harmonize this at a European level so we get the economies of scale, but we get the, the least transactional cost as well. Uh, so we really benefit from coverage across Europe rather than just in a few, few countries. So this was the Green Deal. In the middle of the Green Deal, Ukraine uh, was invaded. Um, and that meant that we had to quickly, rapidly respond to ways in which we could get rid of uh, or replace as much imported Russian gas as, as was possible. Um, and actually, this is where geothermal became, uh, gained a lot more credibility. For those who were able to remember, about two years ago, we wrote a letter off to the European Commission asking for a European geothermal strategy. Um, we didn't get the strategy, but what we did do is we got a, um, a soft target, um, which was to triple geothermal capacity by 2030. This was hidden in the solar energy strategy, but that's really not important. Uh, what's important is, is this is the trigger point for a lot of the actions that happened um, since then. Um, so, for example, the heat pump targets that were that are now kind of uh, committed to, um, they're on hydronic heat pumps so that you focus on those where geothermal actually has a, a strong role to play. Um, and that this is kind of politically the, the hook that a lot of the other European institutions and, um, have used to then start thinking about uh, geothermal at the European level. So this this target, whilst it's, whilst it's lost or hidden, um, it's a very, very important hook for us. Um, Permitting for res, so I mentioned earlier the kind of renewable energy areas, the renewable energy target itself was increased to 42%, but more importantly for uh, aggressive heat pumps with less than 45 megawatt rating, um, they now have a, a, a quick fire three month permitting process um, and that this is retroactive. So this is now enshrined into law. This is the, so every member state, if you have a, you know, a heat pump, a geothermal heat pump, less than 50 megawatts, um, you should be able to use this law to get the permitting process sped up. Um, and this is really for us as an industry to, to make sure that we are we are doing that without you know annoying or, or punishing our, our permitting agencies. Importantly, there was a discussion around electricity market design. Um, even though we had a heating crisis that manifested into an electricity problem because electricity is something where the European Union has competence in, heating is perceived to be a local issue for member states. So the commission has some guidance, but they generally tend not to get too uh, involved. But now with the binding heating and cooling target, they're kind of forced to get more and more interested in this one. There's two things that came out of this one. For the very first time, um, new renewable energy capacity for power generation is limited to just a few technologies, wind, uh, photovoltaics, um, uh, ocean energy and geothermal. I think there's, there's a few more in there as well, but it's really just a very small cabal. So any public, any public subsidy for a brand new piece of kit 
uh, for electricity generation is limited to just a few number of technologies. This is this is a great great uh, uh, boost for geothermal where you where you've got resource enough to do power generation. The other important thing that was added onto this was financial rewards for flexibility services um, and for storage, both of which are things that geothermal has provided but has never really got any recognition for financial reward from. We should now start to see this come and make geothermal even stronger, and much more effective. Um, the two other pieces of legislation was the Net Zero Industry Act and the Critical Raw Materials. <laughs> Key things from all of these is, is that, again, geothermal was listed specifically as one of the priority technologies. Um, you have national uh, exploration campaigns looking for minerals like copper, steel, uh, but also lithium. Um, that will provide a lot of valuable geological data. We need to make sure that data is linked to the geothermal industry or made available to the geothermal industry. Um, and in the Net Zero Industry Act, which is kind of the manufacturing and the component features, there's a there's an element of focusing on reskilling and upskilling uh, people through kind of a, a national academies, training academies. These are all skills. This is this is again one of the things that should address our needs around uh, manpower. Or people power. Okay, this is it. This bit's interesting. So the rest of what we just heard is the kind of the, the legal framework, but the politics was about every single energy technology. There were two discussions that we had, and these are really the things that set the mood music for what, what what's going to happen next. The European Parliament had a quick uh, discussion around um, geothermal. The, the key thing that came out of this is that actually the hostility to geothermal is is li literally just one or two people it's not it's not a it's not a problem intuitively once uh meps some of whom are friends of renewables some of whom hate renewables once they understood the benefits and the services that geothermal provided they pretty much all supported it they all want it they're all kind of complaining that nobody had told them that geothermal existed before this uh this, this conversation started so it shows that once we start to talk about geothermal and we get that visibility, then actually we seem to become the default technology uh, or the default option. Um, and that's a benefit. And we as a community need to start working out how we maximize the most from this political momentum. The same thing happened with the Committee of Regions just after the European Parliament. Committee of Regions is super important because it's all the local governments, all the locally elected officials. So this was a this is a lot of the people who we will be talking to when it comes to heat and cool planning. Uh, heat and cold planning, sorry, they, they reside within the Committee of Regions. Um, and there, they were much more focused on supporting local authorities, actually doing the de heat density mapping, um, and yeah. providing things like a risk in framework so that they don't take on the risk themselves. Really, really very valuable, positive momentum that came out of it. So we know what we want. We've got large parts of what we want. Some of it is kind of diluted. Some of it is very, very specific. What do we need now? So we need to go back to the politics. We need to go back and build that political momentum. Because like I said, um, in a policy-driven market, you know, politics is king. Um, we've started to get some political momentum in that direction. We need to keep it and build upon it. Um, so one of the things we're doing, as we did, uh, as we've been consistently asking for some time, is, is that we need to have a geothermal energy strategy, but we also need to have an action plan with kind of implementable things like those that I demonstrated on the slide deck earlier. Um, within that, we're looking at a target. The target, the final number for the target is more of a political one, but the important thing is, is this then is the hook upon which we can anchor so much of our activity. Uh, we'd like to have an industrial alliance for geothermal. So this um, it allows the industry to come together, meet with regulators, plan, share best practices, and really fast track um, uh, market creation um, and so that every, every market moves from uh, it moves towards a, a some level of maturity. Um, to have a proper conversation around financial risk mitigation, there's no point asking a few countries to develop them and everyone else, um, you know, not being able to benefit. It's important that we spread benefits across the single market, um, across the EU, and also neighbouring countries as well, from the uh, uh, the Icelandic communities to the to uh, Turkey and, and the Western Balkans as well. We need to think big. Uh, Ukraine as well. We need to think big in order to to help de-risk uh, new projects come again. A better understanding of what permitting and planning is, the planning assistance for um, people who are designing systems, but also equipment, the rules, um, you know, standardization, all of these things, that's the political conversation we need to have. 
behind that political conversation, we need to start thinking about geothermal, not from a geothermal industry perspective, but actually how are we part of the energy conversation that's going on? What, how are we part of the climate conversation that, that, that's going on? Because remember, we've been kind of ignored from this in the past. Um, if you talk to anyone who's interested in how do we meet our climate goals, they'll say wind, solar, hydrogen, electric vehicles, and we're kind of, you know, nobody took talks about geothermal. So we have to find a way to fit into the, the 2030 horizon, but also the 2040 horizon. And that means that we need to change some of the conversations that we need to be having. So rather than talking about individual geothermal operations, although they're very, very important, we need to be, we need to be I think, putting them in a system, uh, an energy system benefit process. So rather than saying we can save X number for this individual house or this individual hospital or school, actually across the whole national economy or across the European energy system, this is how much uh, benefits and services we provide to example, to, for example, the electricity system, uh, where we know that it's gonna cost about 800 billion euros to upgrade all of our um, transmission and distribution systems for electricity in order to meet the climate targets that we, we've already agreed. But as much as we can reduce that burden, the better geothermal will become. So thinking systemly, systematically, thinking of not just energy generation, but additional services, storage, flexibility. Um, these are, these are, I think, the, con the narratives that we need to build up so that we, we are part of the conversation, not, not the outliers of the conversation. And that also means then that instead of talking just about geothermal, we need to be um, talking more about how we're a solution to some of the problem era. So everyone, in, traditionally, the discussion has been that buildings is hard to abate. Um, it's, you know, you, you, you're never going to get full coverage. Not everyone's going to go out and do their um, uh, renovations all at the same time. This is where we can start feeding into that solution about geothermal can decarbonize cities at scale. There's some fantastic examples that already exist. This is where we need to play in to, to, to be seen more favorably. As I mentioned earlier, storage is going to become the more critical issue as we get more and more intermittent power generation um, online. Geothermal is really a key off uh, underground thermal energy storage is a key part of that space. Um, and this is something where we have an advantage and we need to be, I think, singing and shouting as early as we possibly can around this one. And then finally, most of the economists who do the planning around targets and cost effectiveness of technologies always talk about learning curves, always talk about cost reductions. Uh, we don't do that in the geothermal sector because we're just not mature enough. But I think this is where we need to start having that conversation and preparing ourselves for saying, well, actually, where are the costs going to be reduced? What, the, what, what are the kind of trend lines that we need to be looking at? So this allows us to have that kind of economic conversation. The others allow us to have a political conversation. But I think we need to combine the two things uh, together. So look, on that note, I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> I've been talking for a long, long time, but I hope I've given you an idea of what's happened over the last couple of years. But more importantly, the responsibilities we have now to kind of shape where we want to go for the next five to 10 years. And I think this is where we, we co-create together. So I hand back to uh, Michelle and uh, Joe. Let's, uh, we take it from there.